Hi there! I have received several questions recently on the tune of how to tell if a capacitor is good or bad. Besides the obvious cases where the capacitor is physically broken or burned or is leaking electrolytes, there is no other visual way to determine if a capacitor is good or not. In most cases, we will need to actually take some measurements on the capacitor itself to be able to establish its status. In this video, we will go through a number of tests that can be executed to see if a capacitor works fine or not. Let's begin. Hi there! I am Carlo Carrano and this is Electronics Engineering Made Easy. An ideal capacitor is a device with two plates and an insulator in between, which we call a dielectric. Because of that, the ideal capacitor, once charged, presents an infinite resistance and therefore behaves like an open circuit in the presence of DC voltage. The reality, however, is very different. A real capacitor needs some wires to be connected to a circuit, and the wires have a resistance that goes in series with the capacitor itself. This resistance, however, can be usually neglected because it is extremely small when compared to the resistance of the ideal capacitor dielectric. The same wires, and often the capacitor itself, because of the way it is built, presents also a small series inductance. This inductance is usually cancelled out by the capacitance itself, but however in high frequency applications may become noticeable. And finally, because sometimes the dielectric is not a perfect insulator, the capacitor will also present a parallel resistance, which is, however, relatively high. When testing a capacitor to make sure it works fine, we have then to address all four of these parameters, the actual capacitance, the series resistance, the series inductance, and the parallel resistance. In fact, we need to make sure that their series resistance and inductance are effectively both negligible, and that the parallel resistance is high enough, depending on the technology used to build the capacitor, of course, and also that the capacitance itself is within the tolerance. We will now go one by one through four methods that are very commonly used to analyze the goodness of a capacitor. Other methods can be used for special cases, like for testing capacitors' behavior to very high frequencies. But that particular behavior goes beyond just checking the goodness of a capacitor for general applications. We will therefore not talk about those two tier methods for now. The first method we want to talk about is related to measuring the RP in the capacitor model, or the parallel resistance. The simple method to do so is to use a multimeter set to measure resistances. Let's see how to do it. I have here a few capacitors, one electrolytic and three film capacitors. To measure the parallel resistance, I am going to use my portable multimeter set for measuring ohms. First thing to do is to discharge the capacitor. We don't want residual charge on it to affect our measurements. In this case, I am just touching the two leads together with my bare hands, Note, however, that this is a small capacitor and I know that it was already discharged. If you are in doubt, don't touch the leads with your bare hands until you have shortened them out with some other piece of metal with an insulated handle, like this. I now connect the leads of the capacitor to the multimeter. Pay attention to the polarity when you do so. Polarized capacitors need to be connected in such a way that the negative lead of the capacitor goes to the negative voltage and the positive lead goes instead to the positive voltage. Right after making the connection, you should see a low resistance, and that's because the capacitor is charging through the battery of the ohmmeter. While the capacitor charges, the resistance will increase. See, now we are already at 1 meg and it is still increasing. A good electrolytic capacitor should show resistance is definitely above 1 meg, and the more you keep it connected, the more the resistance will increase. Keep in mind that the more the capacitor is charged, the slower the resistance will increase. But as long as the resistance is high, an electrolytic capacitor should be considered OK. And of course, we still know nothing about its nominal value. Multimeters that have a range that doesn't go to high resistances will show at this point an overload, usually indicated with a zero followed by an L. 
In this case, the range is much higher, and so we are stuck with these numbers that increase slowly. Once again, don't forget to connect the multimeter probes in such a way that the capacitor is polarized correctly, and know your own multimeter. Some of them, when measuring ohms, output a positive voltage through the black probe instead of the red one, and so be careful. In this case, the probe provides a voltage consistent with the color of the probes. Let's disconnect this capacitor now, and let's use instead this other one, which has a nominal capacity of 220 nanofarad, and so it should charge much faster. Look at the display. The resistance is increasing much faster than with the other capacitor, and we even reach the point of overload, which tells us that the internal parallel resistance of this capacitor is much higher than the electrolytic one. And we have also seen that the capacitor goes through a regular charging cycle. Therefore, this capacitor seems to be good, as well as the previous one, although, again, we haven't measured its actual capacity yet. Let's now use an even smaller capacitor, and let's see how it behaves. And you can see that it charges much faster than the previous one, and we quickly reach the overload on the multimeter. And this happens, of course, because this is a smaller capacitance than the previous one. Let's now do the same test with a very small capacitance, which is in the order of the hundreds of picofarads. Look, in this case we are just measuring an infinite resistance, we didn't see any charging cycle, and so this test is actually inconclusive, because uh, although we know that the parallel resistance is high, we don't really know if the capacitor is broken, because we didn't see it charging. And this is what happens when testing very small capacitors. In such a case, doing a resistance test is fine just to make sure that the capacitor is not shorted, but it is not enough, and so we have to use a different method for checking its goodness. Which is the next method I am going to show you now. This second method is in fact the measurements of the actual capacitance of the capacitor. Many multimeters, like this one, have the capability to make this kind of measurements. Let's start again with the electrolytic capacitor. Black probe on the negative, red probe on the positive, since it is polarized, of course. And the multimeter is giving me about 100 microfarads. Looking at the nominal value of the capacitor, it is actually a 100 microfarad capacitor, and so we now know that this capacitor works, and that its capacitance is about its nominal value. Let's now try the bigger of the film capacitors. I first make sure that it is discharged, and then I connect it to the probes. The polarity in this case does not matter, of course. This one is measuring about 203 nanofarad. The capacitor is actually at 220 nanofarad, but since its tolerance is of plus minus 20%, we are still ok. Note, however, that this reading is not precise, because I am making it using the long cables of the probes, which introduce their own reactants to the measurements. Reactance which is mostly inductive, and therefore tends to cancel out the value of the actual capacitance, although there is also a capacitive component that can increase the reading. Anyway, that would be easier to see in very small capacitors. If the measured capacitance was, however, below the minimum acceptance for the tolerance, then we would have concluded that the capacitor was not that good. Let's now measure the next. This one is measuring 89 nanofarad, while its nominal value is uh, 82 nanofarad. The value is, however, still within the plus minus 20% tolerance of this particular capacitor. Let's now measure the last one. And this is measuring 0 0.26 nanofarad, or uh, 260 picofarad, while its nominal value is 220 picofarad. Remember, though, that these values are not exact because of the long cables. If we need to make more precise readings, we have to use shorter cables, or even better, an instrument specialized for this kind of readings. Let me show it to you. This is an LCR tester. It is a device that only measures inductances, capacitance and resistance, and it is actually better suited to measure the internal parallel resistance of the capacitors. Let's see how it works. And let's start with the electrolytic capacitor. After discharging it, I can connect it to this socket with no cables at all. And you can also see that the instrument tells me how the voltage is applied to the socket, so I can connect a polarized capacitor correctly, with plus and minus in the right place. After inserting the capacitor in the socket, I select first a high range of capacitance, and then I turn on the device. 
and this is the capacitance measured with a much better approximation than the previous, which we did with the multimeter. But we can do more now. We can switch the knob to measure ohms, so we can measure the parallel resistance of the capacitor. And of course, don't forget to discharge the capacitor first and to set the correct scale, not like I did. The resistance is increasing progressively, because we need to wait for the capacitor to charge, of course. If we use a lower scale, we will make the capacitor charge faster, like this, and we can now see that the resistance measurement is going to overload, and so the capacitor is perfectly functioning. Let's now test the bigger film capacitor. Resistance first, which goes into overload, so the capacitor is very well insulated. And now let's measure the capacitance. And uh, it is 205 nanofarad. Let's try with uh, this other capacitor now. Starting with the parallel resistance, all good. And now the actual capacitance, 90.3 nanofarad. A little higher than what we have seen with the multimeter, and that's because of its long cables, as we explained earlier. Finally, let's measure the last capacitor, the smaller one. Resistance first, and... Uh, did you see that? This instrument was actually able to let us see the charging cycle, which we couldn't see on the multimeter. And now it's in overload, as expected. Now we can measure the capacitance, and uh, it gives us 230 picofarad. So this capacitor is good. Time to move to the third method. For this uh, third method test, I am going to forcibly charge the capacitor with a voltage from a power supply, which I set to 10 volts. I also connected to the same capacitor the probes of a digital multimeter set to volts. I am using this device instead of the portable one because I need a greater input impedance, and this DMM gives me 10 megs. On the DMM, you can see the current voltage, which is of course the same 10 volts provided by the power supply. Now that everything is set, I am going to disconnect the power supply from the capacitor, and we will see how long it takes for the voltage of the capacitor to go down, because it will discharge through the input impedance of the instrument. To disconnect the power, I will simply pull the red connector from the generator. Let's keep an eye on the voltmeter while I do so. If it is a good capacitor, with those 10 megs, it will take a while before it discharges entirely. So, cut in the power now. And look, the voltage goes down as expected and takes a while in doing so. Note also how the longer the discharge takes, the slower the voltage lowers. We therefore establish that this capacitor is perfectly capable of holding a charge. If it wasn't, the voltage would have dropped suddenly. Let's try the same test with another capacitor now. I am going to use the electrolytic capacitor, which, because it has a greater capacity, should take longer to discharge, if it is good, of course. When you do that, remember to respect the polarity of the capacitor. When connected to a power supply in reverse, it could even explode, so be careful. Right now, the capacitor is already discharged, as you can see from the really low voltage of its leads. I am going to connect now the power to the capacitor, and see now the voltage is 10 volts. Now I am going to cut the power again, and uh, look, now the voltage goes down, but much more slowly, and that's because we have a greater capacitance. And this is a good indication that the capacitor works fine, since it is capable of being charged, and is also capable of holding the charge for a long period of time. Let's now work on the last method I wanted to show you. This method is best suited to make sure that the parallel resistance of the capacitor is high. The test works this way. I charge the capacitor through the same 10 volts power supply I used for the previous test, but this time I will measure the current that flows through the capacitor by putting an ammeter in series with the capacitor. For an ideal capacitor, once it is charged, there should be no more current, but in the real capacitor there is a loss caused by the parasitic parallel resistance. And here is the residual current measured by the DMM, the very low current reading, 0.07 microamps, tells us that the parasitic resistance in parallel with the capacitor is very low, in the order of, uh, let's see, 10 volts divided by 0.07 microamps, about 150 megs, which tells us that the capacitor is actually very good.
Let's now switch this capacitor with an electrolytic one, so you'll see the difference between the two types of capacitors. Sorry if I tell this one more time, but I really want to emphasize that since this is a polarized component, we need to make sure that we are applying the voltage in the correct direction. Anyway, let's look at the residual current now. And that is about yeah, two order of magnitude higher than with the film capacitor. And this tells us that the electrolytic capacitor under test has a parasitic resistance still higher than 1 meg, but much lower than the film capacitor which is exactly what we expect from a good electrolytic capacitor. If the current was another order of magnitude higher, it meant that the capacitor had a big loss in the internal resistance and therefore it was not good. So, by now it should be very clear that checking if a capacitor is good is very different than doing that with a resistor. The capacitor, although in theory a simple component, because of its reactive effect, it behaves like a very complicated one. And so, to make sure that such a component is good, we need to look at several parameters rather than only its capacitance value. We basically need to make sure that it is well isolated, and therefore it's capable of holding charges well. Please be aware that these are not the only ways to test for a good capacitor. There are other ways to do that, but these are the simplest and can be achieved in a lab with simple and cheap equipment. Now, can you suggest other ways to test a capacitor? Please, share in the comments. And uh, I'll see you in the next video. And in the meantime, happy experiments.